We're getting our first look at Denver's plan to bring in pallet shelters for people on the streets. The idea mocked as tough sheds for the homeless during the mayoral campaign. The legislature blocked the governor's attempt to change land use rules all over Colorado. Today, he announced he's going to do what he can on his own. There's things that we're able to do to uh, deliver more housing sooner. A tornado detection system invented by a 10-year-old, and it's legit. Then, a word about trying to stay positive as a parent, five years after I first shared this. Tonight, on Next. Denver's declared emergency over homeless is get, uh, homelessness is getting extended for another month. The city council has some concerns about the transparency of the Johnson administration. My biggest issue with the transparency is around the financial aspects of this plan. We have been provided very little information on the financial aspects. I'm as concerned as Councilwoman Sawyer about getting details as fast as we can get details. I wonder where the dough is going to come from specifically. The mayor says the state of emergency frees up funding and makes it easier to act quickly on his pledge to get a thousand people off the streets and into shelters by the end of the year. City Council wants more details on how much it will cost and where Denver will get the money. Meanwhile, the Johnston administration is continuing the Hancock administration's sweeps of encampments, and City Council says they're concerned people are still getting lost in the shuffle. City says it will continue to sweep encampments of three or more people, and the city is working on a public database where everyone can track the progress in getting folks off the streets. In a somewhat related situation, the city's emergency declaration for migrant shelters is going to quietly expire tonight, and we've learned that that's happening at the mayor's request. His spokeswoman says that's because arrivals have been slowing and services are keeping up with demand. On the plans for temporary shelters to help address homelessness, this week, Denver City Council will consider paying $7 million for 200 pallet shelters. They could be delivered as early as November. The units come in two sizes, 70 square feet, 120 square feet. The manufacturer says they can sleep one or two people. Mayor's office is also asking council for the funds to furnish the units with beds, desks, air conditioning, and heaters. The proposal suggests setting up three separate sites for these units with bathrooms and laundry there on site, as well as larger buildings, community gathering spaces. The use of these transitional housing units has been criticized by some advocates who think that that money would be better spent on actual housing, like permanent housing. This is how that played out in a mayoral debate. Question for Terrence Roberts. You said that people experiencing homelessness don't want to live in tough sheds. <clears throat> Whose plan are you talking about with the tough shit? I'm definitely talking about Mike's plan. <laughs> <laughs> Do those things even have plumbing? What homeless people are saying is they want house keys. They don't want to live in a shed with 50 other people in other sheds without plumbing, without AC, without heat. They're not tough sheds. Um, they are, in fact, tiny homes that have heating, that have access to showers, that have access to kitchens, that have all the wraparound services people need, and they are a transitional plan. This specific type of pallet shelter is already being used in Aurora. They installed dozens of them two years ago. Democratic Governor Jared Polis is taking unilateral action today on affordable housing after Democrats and Republicans voted down his sweeping land use plan in the legislature. Our Mark Salinger explains what the governor's order can and cannot do. Colorado mountain towns are about as expensive as they are beautiful. Summit County is in full-blown crisis, there's no question. Tamara Pote will be the first to admit her town is unaffordable. Last year, uh, the average price of a residential unit in Summit County was $2.14 million. She's a commissioner in Summit County. When the county tries to build more affordable housing, it gets caught up for months at the state level, like a new $5 million grant to build homes in Dillon. It has taken us many, many months to get that grant approved, to get the contract signed, to get the money to us so that we can begin development. People like teachers, resort employees, and even first responders have nowhere to live unless they can afford a million dollar home on a ski instructor salary. If we are not as aggressive as possible, which really does require a partnership with the state, we won't be able to protect the nature of our community moving forward. Today, the state is stepping in. Everybody. After a failed attempt earlier this year to pass a bill to change land use rules in Colorado, Democratic Governor Jared Polis used executive action today to tackle affordable housing. We want to make sure that we reduce red tape, streamline the process, and internally focus on getting it out the door. The order reduces the amount of time the Department of Housing has to approve loans and grants from 240 days down to 90 
While it'll speed up construction, it does far less than what the land use bill would have done. It doesn't touch on topics like the controversial zoning changes or additional dwelling units in Polis's failed top priority legislation. There's things that we're able to do to uh, deliver more housing soon. In Summit County, anything to build more homes is a step in the right direction. For us to be most effective in resolving the crisis, there has to be good partnership and collaboration between state and local government. What's at stake here is not whether or not Colorado will grow. We know that more people are moving here and more, continue, more will continue to move here in the future. Polis says if the state doesn't push regulations that help affordable housing, we'll see growth in all the wrong places. One example is people having to commute for hours and housing sprawls because the city's tile will become just simply too expensive to live in. So in a lot of ways, though, we're kind of where we were before Polis's legislative effort in the municipalities, cities and counties are kind of going it alone as the governor's now go it alone to the extent that he can. Sure, and now they're trying to combine both of them together. But when you look at Summit County, they're doing something really interesting that no community in the entire nation has done, mm -hmm. and that is working with the U.S. Forest Service to lease land from the federal government for affordable housing. They're the first in the nation to do that. Hmm. That's that's interesting stuff. Chris Bianchi, wave high in the background there. Do we have Mark shining us? There, there you go, buddy. There we'll, you go. We'll see you in a, in a minute. In a minute, Chris. <laughs> Thank you very much. Win for Colorado Democrats today as the state Supreme Court declined to block their tax measure that would take Tabor refunds to cut property taxes. Republicans sued, saying that ballot question is misleading. Proposition HH will effectively ask you if you want to give up part of your future Tabor refunds in exchange for a reduction in property tax increases near term. Democrats pushed that through the legislature in the final days of the session. Republican legislators and some Republican-led counties filed suit shortly after. They claimed that the ballot initiative was misleading and unconstitutional because it touched on more than one subject. State Supreme Court rejected that complaint about misleading language and said that the single issue question can only be ruled on after voters pass Prop HH in November. Essentially, you have to pass it to find out if what's in it is constitutional. Almost immediately, a judge in Aurora cited that Supreme Court ruling to reject a challenge to Mayor Mike Kaufman's plan to give himself more power. That judge said that voters will have to weigh in on Kaufman's strong mayor concept before the courts can decide if the ballot measure was legal. The state attorney general's office is reducing the charges for two Aurora police officers charged in the death of Elijah McClain. Prosecutors said that decision gets rid of redundant charges, but ones that could increase the prison sentences of those officers if they're convicted. Former Aurora police officer Jason Rosenblatt and current officer Randy Redima still face charges including manslaughter and criminal negligent homicide. Elijah McClain died in 2019. Police had stopped him despite the fact that he had done nothing wrong. Officers then put him in a carotid hold. And paramedics injected him with the sedative ketamine. He died several days later. Our legal analyst Scott Robinson says that dropping those charges might simplify things for the jury. The prosecutors may believe that they, they are simplifying their case that they're going to present to jurors. After all, it's a relatively complex case for both the paramedics and the police officers involved. The officers are scheduled to go on trial mid-September. Another officer, Nathan Woodyard, is being tried separately. And the two paramedics, the ones who injected McLean with ketamine, they're scheduled to be tried last in November. In another police brutality case that made headlines, Clear Creek County says it is now ready to launch its mental health crisis co-responder program. That was part of a record-setting settlement after the police shooting of Christian Glass. Clear Creek County says the program will originally be staffed with a community paramedic and a licensed crisis clinician, and they'll be overseed by county EMS. They'll be dispatched to psychiatric calls, reports of people who may be suicidal, welfare checks. The county was required to create this program by 2025. It was a condition of the $19 million settlement reached with the Glass family for the shooting and killing of their son last year. The settlement also requires all current Clear Creek County patrol officers to be certified in crisis intervention by the start of 2027. You came through in a huge way for this big back-to-school, backpack-and-school supply drive in northern Colorado. So for decades, each year, the CSU community has volunteered to pack thousands of bags full of supplies for the school's cool effort. They reach every student in need in the Poudre School District. But they were about $20,000 short of funds this year until your latest Word of Thanks microgiving campaign raised $30,000. You covered their needs for this year's drive and got them started for next year. Your giving has done $11 million worth of good all over Colorado since 2020. If you have an idea of where we can help anywhere in this state, 
I read each and every email that comes to next at 9news.com. The tornado alley is expanding and moving, which is a big problem. A kid from Lone Tree has a plan to detect tornadoes and get the warnings out earlier. The experts are impressed. And former Trump attorney John Eastman agrees to an expensive bond in Georgia. It's a good thing that he's got a gig these days with the Colorado Republican Party. That's next. The Colorado Republican Party, which is essentially broke these days, has said that it may pay John Eastman and another attorney up to a quarter million dollars as they try to ban unaffiliated voters from the GOP primary. Eastman could certainly use the cash because just today it came out that he has agreed to a $100,000 bond for his criminal indictment in Georgia. Eastman was working as then-President Donald Trump's attorney when he helped craft the plan to overturn the 2020 election. Eastman says it was just politics, you know? Prosecutors say it was just a crime, you know, specifically racketeering, conspiracy, and filing false documents. As a condition of this bond, Eastman won't be allowed to communicate with any co-defendants or witnesses in the case. That would include Colorado attorney Jenna Ellis, who has not agreed to bond conditions on her charges yet. Last week, she publicly called on Trump to assist with her legal costs and the cost of the other Trump co-defendants. She says she hasn't seen a dime. Tonight's next question comes from Brian, who wants to know why Hillary was categorized as a hurricane last week. Isn't that just for storms over the Atlantic? That's a good question, Brian. I don't know. I bet you Crispy Donkey knows. <laughs> I, but right, isn't it Typhoon Pacific? It's Hurricane Atlantic. What am, I, what am I missing? What is Brian missing? Pretty much right. And also in the Indian Ocean, it's a cyclone. And Kyle, get this. In Australia, I'm not making this up, yeah. they call them willy willies. That's what they refer to a tropical cyclone. It's all the same thing. Yeah, I think I learned that from my kids' bluey shows, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, regardless, and what actually divides things here, so it's actually a really good question there, Brian. Uh, east of the international dateline, it's a hurricane, but west of it, it's a typhoon. And by the way, we've had this a few times. Uh, just This is a broad map. That's Hawaii right there. There's Alaska. And once the international dateline's roughly about here, once a storm crosses over, and we've had this again a few times, it is considered to be a hurricane, then a typhoon. So how about that? Now, no typhoons, no cyclones, no willy willies headed our way here in Colorado. But what we had a lot of today, a lot of heat. 99 degrees, tying our warmest days so far this year and breaking the daily record that was last set in 2007. A lot of 100 plus degree temperatures out on the eastern plains. Officially at the airport, it was 99 here at the 90s studios. It got up to 100 degrees, 70s, 80s for us here into the high country for the most part. For tonight, those temperatures drop back into the upper 60s. Another mild evening for us, and those temperatures are going to stay warm for tomorrow, but a tick cooler, a bit more cloud cover in the afternoon for tomorrow, and a better chance for maybe an isolated shower or storm in the high country. But I think here along the front range, it's going to stay on the dry side, but again, into the mountains and the high country. That's where you're looking. That's in those showers and storms. Again, by Wednesday, a bit more widespread, those showers and storms in the high country, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Cools on down with widespread showers and storms by Friday. I want to patent my device because it can be enhanced for wildfires, which is a really big problem. Preventing both wildfires and tornadoes? 10-year-old Colorado's idea is getting national attention. That's next. A 10-year-old from Lone Tree thinks he's got a way to get weather warnings to people more quickly, possibly save lives. His concept is serious enough that it's getting serious attention. In 2020, I saw that there were tornadoes across the country and it wasn't acceptable. Hello, my name is Anya Drau and I'm in sixth grade and I go to STEM school Highlands Ranch. So this is Revere, which is an early tornado warning system. The tornado alley is expanding and moving, which is a big problem. And my device is projected to increase the warning time for about 13 minutes to 40 minutes. So this is an Arduino. I created a device which combines infrasound, a network of autonomous drones, and other environmental sensors. My device is named after Paul Revere, our famous American revolutionary, 
who warn people of the British like mine warns people of tornadoes. Imagine in the outskirts of a city, there's a base station as well as a network of autonomous drones that fly in all directions. The drone then sends the data to the base station, which then calculates the data to see if it's a dangerous tornado and what category is it. I'm excited for Virir. I found the Paradigm Challenge Award in 2021, and I really wanted to apply for the challenge. I was picked as a finalist, which was really cool. The winner is Revere. Anu, come on up. I won $25,000 and an uh, opportunity to patent my device. I want to patent my device because it can be enhanced for wildfires, which is a really big problem we're seeing in the United States. Landslides and animal trackings, which are also really important. If you have an idea for a life-changing idea, you should really do it because it can save a lot of lives. It can help a lot of people. That's exceptional. Rao says he plans to donate part of his winnings to charity, and use the rest to help pay for college. I should mention his sister, appeared on Next years ago. She's an inventor, too. A life update of sorts tonight from along the road that so many of you have walked as well. So about five years ago, I was away from here for a bit and returned with an announcement. As often as we talk about daughters having daddies wrapped around their little fingers, nature, of course, dictates that it literally begins in reverse with hers wrapped around mine. The moment this happened, I offered her a pony, out loud, out, at the hospital, I'm serious, I just kind of blurted out, do you want a pony? I hope she does not remember that when she's old enough to ask for a pony. Five years later, my baby is a not so little girl, still no pony, uh, she, she has no idea that she can ask for a pony. Five years later, I remain impossibly wrapped around her finger. It was the hand that I held walking to kindergarten today. Parents certainly know the meaning of that moment, right? She is moving from our world into the world. Our world, all she has ever known, has been a wonderfully happy place to be a kid. The world is not always a happy or kind or safe place to be a kid, or a grown-up for that matter. I hope she doesn't realize it right away. I'm encouraged knowing that she is going to carry some of our world into the world, and that your kids are doing the same. Maybe, with their help, we can move things in the right direction for all the kids who deserve to live in a world that is just as wonderful as they imagine. Your feedback's next. It's a sign that the elk are evolving and we better be careful. How else do you explain what John saw up in Estes Park? That elk is clearly reading that sign. If they learn how to read, we had better hope that they are only interested in golf. If you see a sign that jumps out at you, send it to us next at 9news.com or use the hashtag HeyNext. Tom writes in tonight about John Eastman, the former Trump attorney, ter current attorney for the Colorado Republican Party, indicted in Georgia. Tom says Eastman is a lawyer. He was asked for a legal opinion. He gave it from legal research. Now, how is he a criminal? I am not an attorney, Tom, but based on my reading, uh, lawyers can't conspire with their clients to commit crimes. That's going to be the question before that jury in Georgia, whether Eastman and Trump did that. Kara says, thanks for sharing your thoughts on your baby girl's first day at kindergarten. Not sure how you got through that without crying. I will let you in on the secret, Kara. The trick is to read it aloud about a dozen times after I write it. See you next time.